God morgen. God morgen alle sammen. Velkommen til dag to. Jeg håper dere hadde en hyggelig kveld i går. Ja. Bra. Så håper jeg dere er veldig klar for dag to. Ja. Flott. Jeg ønsker alle i salen velkommen til dag to, og også dere som følger dagen på stream. Nå kommer jeg til å switche over til engelsk igjen. Because I have the very great pleasure of introducing today's keynote, professor Tara Brabazon. We are very, very lucky to have you here. Professor Brabazon is the Dean of Graduate Research and Professor of Cultural Studies at the Flinders University, Adelaide, Australia. She's a specialist in, among other fields, uh, city planning, the knowledge economy, information literacy, and popular culture. A very fascinating combination. In her scholarly work, these fields are combinated in a fascinating ways, often. And I'm particularly fond of one of the titles of one of your recent articles. The title is, Winter is Coming. <laughs> Doctoral Supervision in the Neoliberal University. So there you have the combination. Professor Brabazon has won six awards for her teaching and supervision, and she's the author of a huge number of books and articles widely published in academic journals. And when we learned that among these are titles like The University of Google, Education in the Post-Information Age, and The Disintermediated Librarian, and A Reintermediated Future, all of us library employees should sharpen our ears. Some of us have had the great joy of hearing you speak at conferences such as LILAC and ESIL. And we know that we have every reason to be happy that you accepted our invitation. You came all the way from Adelaide, Australia to Oslo to address us. So please give her a warm welcome. The floor is yours. Let's think about the worst uses of digitization. <laughs> Conducting international foreign policy via tweet. Dumping a boyfriend via a text message. And of course, my personal favorite, loading up photographs and videos of a former partner onto a revenge porn site. Now, are any of these issues or challenges caused via a lack of digital literacy, or are they caused by ignorance, foolishness, and self-absorption? <laughs> Let me put it another way, ladies and gentlemen. How often in our Facebooked, mobile phone screened universe do you ever ponder the languages, the knowledges that you do not have? Put another way. How do you know what you do not know? There is a great deal of flab to digitization. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to get you digitally fit. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. And our gig today is titled, Why I Don't Do, interesting use of the verb, Why I Don't Do Digital Literacies. And what I want to do is offer some arguments for your consideration. I'm going to present four alternative models, four alternative conceptualizations, four alternative tropes for you to ponder why perhaps we shouldn't be using the phrase digital literacy. To say that I am happy to be here is an understatement. I've come a long way to see you because you are splendid. <laughs> and we need to remember that some of the best work on this planet 
is happening in this very special area of the world. So it is my privilege to be with you today. And what we're going to do is we're going to summon some old theories, some old media and some old idea, ideas uh, and show that recycling is quite a useful strategy. There is no past in the history of ideas. Are you ready? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Yes. Let's do this with the bias of communication. Now, we're going to start in Canada. So many Canadian theories, theorists and scholars gained international power and status. The best known is, of course, Marshall McLuhan, who created the cliché of the 20th century. The medium is the message. But his influential mentor, Harold Innes, is very frequently forgotten. Alexander Watson, his great biographer, described him as a marginal man, the Old Testament of communication theory, whereas McLuhan was the New Testament of communication theory. So Harold was born in 1894. He died in 1952. That's the year where the Sony transistor radio was invented and the videotape was invented. So his life spanned the movement from newspaper culture to television culture. It spanned the movement from the national communication system to an international communication system. So being Canadian mattered a great deal to and it has some relevance for those of us who don't live in the United States or the United Kingdom. Because Canada, like many of us, is managing the colonisation of both the United States and the United Kingdom. But it meant that Canadian scholars like Innes and McLuhan were able to ponder the big ideas in the culture, like colonisation, like identity like thinking about space. So Harold Innes was a very famous academic throughout his career. He explored earnest topics, if you will, as a political historian, an economic historian. He looked at the history of the cod industry, the history of wheat as an industry. So he was a real rager, we're getting the sense of that. And his PhD investigated the Canadian railway system. So he was a real party animal, as we're picking up. But what he did show through his career is that geography and space really mattered. And he wasn't interested in the colonisation of space. He was interested in how space was tempered, how it was managed with respect. But what is so remarkable, at the point of his career where most people wind down, right at the end of his career, in the final five years of his life, he moved to a brand new topic, communication systems. He became interested in incredibly large variables, time and space. He offered in his writing, quote, a plea for time and, quote, the problem of space. He became fascinated with the notion of bias. So when we think about bias these days, ladies and gentlemen, particularly post-Trump and Brexit, we think about politicians and journalists with a very skewed view of the world, a blinkered view of the world. But he argued that societies are dominated by a medium of communication. So clay, papyrus, parchment, or paper, and each of these media create a different monopoly of knowledge. So a society that's able to balance its space-oriented media and its time-oriented media keeps its power relations in check. So if the bias of communication is not recognised, then the powerful increase their power. So bias is used quite differently in Harold Innes's work to our current usage. Think of a bias cut top or a bias cut dress. You knew we'd go into fashion, darlings. What this means is a frock or a top is cut in a particular way, encouraging movement in a particular direction. You're with me, I'm getting nods, that's fabulous. So when Innes used the word bias, he wasn't using it politically or assuming a series of views in a particular direction, but he argued that a community 
communication system was cut in a particular way, in a particular direction, emphasising particular modes of thinking and communicating and decentering other modes. So whenever we talk about a bias of communication, just remember the cut of that fabric. What Innes did, he uses his examples, the Greek and the Roman empires. In the case of the Greek empire, he showed that it was based on oral communication. It was about building groups, building community, stories conveyed through time. The Roman empire, and again, the Romans, again, were not terribly party people. They were very interested in power and respect. So they used written communication, to write down Roman law and to pass it around the empire. So this bias of communication that we're discussing today is really brilliant. But Harold Innes is really focused on for his own work. He's talked about as the great mentor of Marshall McLuhan, and that's a shame. That's why we're bringing sexy back today, and we're bringing Harold Innes back today. Because the choice of media determines the type of empire that is constructed. So Innes particularly was influenced and interested in the senses, as we should be. What happens when a culture is organised for the ear rather than the eye? Importantly, Innes was not a technological determinist. What makes him important is he asks us all to think about the sensory element in the way in which we think about communication, and particularly what happens when the bias is skewed to the visual. And of course, we're living that system right now. So Innes's bias of communication is a theory of culture, a theory of politics, a theory of the political economy. It is also a theory of technology. So space media prioritizes the I, the individual. So that's paper. It's also electronic communication. But time-based media prioritizes the ear, the group, the community sustaining stories over time. So what Innes argues for, for all of us, is we need to combine space and time-based media. This combination was a way to ensure that balances were in place and the dominance of today's web would worry him, but I think he'd be terribly interested in podcasting in how sound is brought back into the web. So for me, his great book, The Bias of Communication, is one of the great books of the 20th century, but to borrow the great line from his biographer, he is a marginal man. But uh, every generation finds new uses for his marginality. His only flaw, and it is a productive one, I think, is he argued, and you might want to argue with me about this, that disempowered communities would inevitably use new media forms to renegotiate their power structures. So the disempowered would be drawn to the new. Now, I think as we all know, the empowered tend to use the new technology and others get left behind. Having said that, Google Maori was released on J July 23, 2008, which created Maori-based searching for the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and provided a really interesting way of thinking about a decolonised post colonial Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is significant, I hope, that we remember we have five senses, but space-biased media, space -biased media cuts away four of those senses. So in our age, the eye and the visual dominate. So to understand this complex bias of communication and how we can critique it and create a reimagining, I move to our second model of the day, explaining why I don't do digital literacy. How are you going? Are you fine? Are you ready for number two? Let's do this, which is media literacies. Now, media literacies, big area, it is a way to understand platforms and interfaces. Significantly, media literacy has been a very, very small part of media studies and education degrees throughout my life, and I'm impossibly old. When dinosaurs roamed the earth, that's when I did my undergraduate degrees. But in the last few years, media literacy has been discovered by 
media regulators. So in a post-national media and information system with millions of creators, it is impossible to censor that many people. You can't create thresholds that work, like you can't swear before 8.30 at night, good luck with that. You can't censor yourself into a coma because supposedly pornography is not available on the internet. Good luck with that. So there are a series of bottom-up strategies that are able to work quite effectively with media literacy that are multimodal, that are translocal, transregional, transnational, and solve a lot of the problems with access, disability and impairment access particularly, but also operate within the extremes of the market. Importantly, I've worked in media literacy for 17 years, and it's been a fascinating 17 years. Why I'm drawn to it is it brings together three areas, media studies, cultural studies, and education studies. So it's got a bit of good politics, but an edginess to it. But if the last 20 years of media policy have taught us anything, it is that top-down regulation is always much slower than the changes to media itself. So in a time of accelerated media, we have lagging media policy. So self-regulation of media via media literacy is one of the strongest ways in which to enact and change that process. So from the foundation of Ofcom, the Office of Communication in the UK, that was present in the 2003 legislation that created it. But much to my endless amusement, of course, they were thinking they invented this concept. The European Commission, of course, invented it in 2002, the year before, because they argued it created a lot more social justice with media content. So I'm sure we wish uh, our colleagues in the United Kingdom every good luck uh, post-Brexit as they get rid of one set of media literacy laws and move into another. So what's crucial, I think, in this discussion here is in all these different organisations, whether it be the European Commission, whether it be the BBC, whether it be Ofcom, None of them explore formal education, the role of schools and universities in developing media literacy, and this is important. There is an assumption that we learn from the media by simply using it. Interesting. So to explain what's problematic with that particular set of arguments, I'm going to summon another old theorist, Jean Baudrillard, Simulacra and Simulation. This book was published in 1981. It seemed to be the key book of postmodernity, particularly critiquing the flawed notion of the vulgar Marxism that existed at the time. But most importantly, what makes this book powerful and still resonant is it plays with knowledge. It plays with truth. It opens with a quote from Ecclesiastes that's actually a fake. And you know, generations, thousands of people have quoted Ecclesiastes from this book. And of course, it wasn't a quote. Baudrillard just made it up and he lied. So to quote Ecclesiastes, Baudrillard, that's really the basis of our model. Particular phrases I'd like to draw your attention to. The simulacrum is true. And he talks about a system of equivalences. That's important. We'll come back there. So what I'm going to do is we could endlessly go on with this abstraction and this theory, but I'm going to conceptualise for you this particular paradigm, and I'm going to take it for a walk. So let's say that Baudrillard has a model of life, reality, what we experience right now. So there is the real, then the next layer, like a sandwich, is a representation, and at the top is the simulacrum. So what this means is any action, any event, anything that actually happens is immediately represented and then almost immediately re-represented. So real representation, re-representation. So this means that information is almost immediately disconnected from its context. It unhooks from reality and floats about in the simulacrum. So we are so accustomed to celebrities and consumerism that we think we're living in reality. Actually, we're living through other people's representations. We're spending more and more time in the re-represented space. So yes, life is real. 
<laughs> really it is. Depends what drugs you're on, but yes, life is real. And tabloidized media means that most of us, most of the time, are living in the simulacrum. When I arrived in Oslo on Sunday afternoon, I put the television on, Keeping Up With The Cardassians was the program that was on the moment I put the telly on. So there are serious consequences of this model for a flattening of debate. We've got a confusion between experience and expertise. So in such a context, the internet can offer quick and easy alternative sources, but there's a greater space for ideologues to perpetuate their message. So what we've got is fast, unverified rumour that's given a priority over verified journalism. So the speed at which ideas are expressed and the truncated vocabulary used to express them make it very difficult to encourage high quality research. This means that cliches replace commentary and there's a reduction in time between information availability and the rip and read news cycle. Now, none of this was caused by technology. What it was caused was a bleeding of funding away from librarians, libraries, teachers, and education. So what I would like to add to Baudrillard's model today, what I'm adding to this paradigm, is I'm suggesting that the real, the representation, the simulacrum, that's a cascading model. So that means the simulacrum in one model becomes the real for the next. That means that transitory and ephemeral celebrity culture is now our new reality. So when you ask, how did Brexit happen? How did Trump happen? This is how it happened. Twitter is the great signifier of the simulacrum. Let me show it to you. Unbelievably, at some point, Donald Trump was actually a person. <laughs> then he went on to, get ready for this phrase, reality television in The Apprentice, and then stunningly, he became president of the United States. Who knew? So let's now move that simulacrum to the next reel, where Donald Trump is the president. And then, of course, Alec Baldwin's ended up doing a better Trump than Trump. <laughs> and then we've now got this fantastic comedy program on the presidents that basically does a revision of Trump's week at the end of each week. That's the new simulacrum. Right, let's apply this for librarians and libraries. The library is real, the online library is a representation, Google is a simulacra, boom. So through this cascading model, ladies and gentlemen, a simulacrum is layered and it is textured. At its most basic, that blinking Google cursor asks us to ask it something. And that's great, very easy to type a few words into a box. But it's incredibly difficult to possess the language, the vocabulary and the knowledge to actually get some sense from it. It is a great engine to shop. It's not a great engine to think about information in education. So, we've now done media literacy. Take a breath. Are you ready for concept three, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Let's do some damage with InfoLit. So, when teachers and librarians, us, when we celebrate the signifier, we celebrate the form, we celebrate the media, we are decentering how the medium is being used. So, that is a denial of content, context, and expertise. It's also a validation of the new rather than the useful. So the third model I present to you today to not talk about digital literacies is to build on that discussion of media literacies and the bias of communication. So yes, I'm working with InfoLit. And the model I'm going to deploy, again, another old model that we're bringing back, is from Mary Macken Horowitz. Now, this model existed after Web 1, but before Web 2. And that modelling, ironically, really helped her argument because she was interested in investigating continuities rather than revolutions. She wasn't evangelically connected to any particular innovation or media platform. She wanted to construct a mode of literacy that moved through education and life. So as you can see, she presented a model of literacy with four slices, four tiers, moving from everyday to applied to theory 
theoretical to reflexive. But the key in this model is about movement. You've got to move people between and through these slices of literacy. Keep moving, keep reading, keep thinking, keep challenging yourself moving on. So everyday literacies are gained in the family home, socialisation, learning to be a boy, learning to be a girl, learning about oral communication. Applied literacies, this is significant, involve applied expertise, skill development in particular, literacy with a purpose, and vocationalism is part of that slice. Then theoretical literacy. This is inserted into academic disciplines. It's part of what we do in schools and in universities. So the theoretical tier is where we start to think about referencing, we start to think about refereeing, and this is where we do the crunchy disciplinary work. But it doesn't finish there. We've got reflexive literacy at the end. Yes, it is a form of critical literacy. It involves understanding and negotiating social diversity, interdisciplinarity, and questioning epistemology. So there is no sense in this model that information should move between platforms. Just because it can doesn't mean it should. So the cut and paste culture requires some thinking and some intervention. So there's a lot of provocative hypotheses going on here that really could transform your life. The first is that critical literacy is not an add-on to literacy debates, but it must come after the instrumental modes have been gained. And also, there must be an intervention. You don't naturally move between these literacy modes. A teacher or a librarian has to intervene and move you through those layers. So without these interventions by librarians and teachers, most of the population will and are staying in applied literacies, using Google to shop and having no sense of higher order information. So Mary Mackin Horowick argues that there is a linear relationship between these modes, so you can't learn to read and critique what you're reading at the same time, but she does argue that all literacy modes must build on easier ones. So the concern, I think, that emerges from Mary Mackin Horowitz's model, which she doesn't address, and what we need to, is how do learners and citizens move from literacies to learning? How do we intervene? How do we stop people giving up and cooking crystal meth? The other question is, how do we know what we do not know? So without interventions, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have generations of people stuck in applied literacies, not even knowing what they don't know. So our goal is to create a curriculum that enables a consciousness in the understanding of the different modes of literacy that are available. So I'll give you one example I did. I've done it multiple times since, but in 2008, I had a problem when I was writing a brand new course, the Master of Arts Creative Media at the University of Brighton. I had such a diversity of students, 80% of them were outside of the EU, and they came from such a diversity of backgrounds, no assumed knowledge was possible, and their ages were 24 to 70. So therefore, I needed to find a way in a single mandatory module to work out where they were in literacy terms and get them to at least theoretical literacy and with a bit of luck through to reflexive literacy. So the first assignment in their methods module was an annotated bibliography, important. So they selected their particular research method and then I put an information scaffold in place. I demanded that they find particular modes of sources. So they gained experience moving online to offline. They gained experience with podcasts. They gained experience with professional organisational websites. So this model of information literacy, I would argue, is incredibly useful to us now because it creates an opportunity for us to think about form and content. Content in context. And speaking of content in context, my final model for your consideration. You ready to bring this home, darlings? <laughs> Let's do it. I believe this will be the big term of the next 10 years, multimodality. 
What I'm arguing for today, ladies and gentlemen, is we need to construct a matrix of information and media literacy, but we need to bring them together in some way. Form and content, signifier and signified, how do we bring them together? I want something that is not clunky. I want something that is smooth. Not digital literacies, not analog literacies, but move. Analog, digital, historical, simulacrum. There are incredible opportunities that all of us confront in this new information environment. Print-on-demand publishing, we've got incredible podcasting that's freely available, and really courageous academics assuming the editorship of online journals. But media literacy and information literacy must come together, and I think we've been too glib in assuming they will just nest or cluster. They won't. You see, digitisation can enable citizenship, but you've got to have broadband, you've got to have high-level information literacy, and you've got to have some dough. You've got to have some money to buy the ever-expanding platforms. And if any one of those variables is missing, then access does not create knowledge. Access does not create literacy. There's never been more choice of platforms than we have right now. It's never been easier to move information between platforms. But simply because information can move doesn't mean that it should. We need a series of mitigating steps. Who's your audience? What's the context? And what the hell are we trying to achieve? The truncation and the automation of decision-making, sometimes referred to as disintermediation, is having an effect on teaching and learning and research. And one of the great scholars in my life, Neil Postman, what a legend, was very, very clear about the impact of technology on learning. He argued that technology was altering our very conceptualization of learning. So we need to remember, and let's just call a spade a shovel here. You've brought an Australian, so I'm gonna give you some Australian stuff. now. Teaching and learning is not efficient. Teaching and learning is not meant to make a profit. Full stop. Learning is not downloading. Teaching is not like saving onto a hard drive. How are you going to decide, yes, decide, what platform is the best place for that information? When do you leave a text? When do you actually talk to someone orally? When do you send a tweet? This matters. So to answer this question, I'm going to talk about multi-modality. And let me present this visually. I'm changing my mind on this diagram all the time. So this is what I'm wedded to at the moment. Think of information as everything around us, everything that our senses give to us, the sensory data that's brought into our body is information. Information literacy is part of that, Media literacy is part of that. Notice the circles don't touch, but they touch when multimodality links the two of them. So let's break this down. What the hell is multimodality? Multi means, thanks for playing. Mode is the platform or the channel, and alate as it exists in multimodality, physicality from French alate, from the Latin alatus, the condition of the previous word. So physicality, the state of being physical, multimodality, the condition or the state of being multimodal. So the word refers to the many platforms and the channels that exist for us. So there are powerful consequences of multimodality for us when we're thinking about the information scaffold. The information scaffold is like a ladder, one step at a time, and if we think about that, it operates effectively for knowledge generation as well, gaining a skill, gaining ability, and deploying it in a new context. So it starts when we're all comfortable in one mode, and then we move to the next. Why I like it as a teacher is through multimodality, we're able to improve and work with our strengths and also improve and work with our weaknesses. This is a way to move from everyday literacies through to those reflexive literacies. And that's why I very rarely use the phrase new media or digital media, because it suggests that stuff is new. It suggests that stuff is digital. Well, I'm sorry, every single media is based on earlier media, and every single literacy 
is based on early literacies. So multimodality allows us to take stock of where we are now and gain consciousness of where we are going next. But most importantly, multimodality is the most valuable skill for those of us who are interested in creating inclusive communication environments because it allows us to connect platform, information, and audience. Now, let's go back a bit. Modality is the characteristic, modality, not multi, modality is the characteristic by which the real or the normal is constructed. So as we move through life and we believe we're dealing with real life, that's modality. Multimodality is different because it recognises there are multiple truths, multiple identities, multiple contexts. And only when we recognise that multiplicity, we see why communication so often does not function. Multimodality proves that the medium is not the message, does not the message. Our reality, what we believe, is based on our life, our interpretation of signifiers, of forms. Now, we do trust some signs and we don't trust others. And each of us have particular signifiers, particular forms that suggest to us that we can trust this person. Often it involves clothing, a bloke in a suit, we tend to believe. <laughs> um, a news reader is believed because they're well dressed, they have a low voice, and they look directly at the camera. So, because they do that, it's supposedly trustworthy, right? So, modality cues, therefore, are based on our experience of the world. We think we know what's going on. We need to know what's going on or else we'd stay drunk and in bed. So because the modality cues are working well around us, we get out of bed and we function most of the time. But stuff does go wrong and that's when assumptions about age or gender or class or sexuality start to impact on what we do. So all the stuff about the young people. The young people and the online environment makes me crazy. Makes me crazy. Mark Prensky, 2001, right? Digital natives. It was wrong in 2001. It's just ridiculous now. We need to move on. So the assumption that the young people are doing anything in particular is just nonsense. Therefore, we need to match the audience with the information with the platform. Wonderful guy called Gunther Kress is the key theorist of multimodality, and I recommend him to you. He built social semiotics with Robert Bob Hodge through the 1980s and moved to a specialisation in iconography and imagery through the 1990s. Through the 2000s, multimodality became his focus. He determined the best use of platforms. He has focused particularly on education, particularly of the bubs, the little people, people and how visuality and communication can help kids in primary school and the role of visual communication in learning. But I'm arguing now that multimodality is the most important concept of our time because of globalisation, because these communication texts can move through space and time. Now, just because something can move digitally does not mean that it should. It does not mean it's the best or even appropriate way to express information. Let me give you some examples of this. There are many multilinguistic environments in our life. One of my former students, actually at the University of Brighton, in that course, uh, Sayed Al Almuldi. Hi, Sayed. Uh, he came up with a crucial problem. He was looking at Mecca and the annual pilgrimage, the Hajj. And because the multiple guys and gals who were coming on the pilgrimage spoke multiple languages, had multiple contexts, multiple modalities, they weren't able to understand what was going on in the environment. So he moved and created a series of iconographic symbols for the Hajj to enable people to make their way through the space and time. And the Saudi Arabian government thanked him for that and is now using it. So this is a great example of multi-modality at work, knowing when words will work and knowing when images will work. And if you want to understand why terrorism is happening, why xenophobia is destroying this planet. There's the Gunther Kress rule. If you take that seriously, that will transform your life. The greater the cultural difference, the greater the differences in terms of representational systems and literacies. So in other words, we're all walking around in our own modality, assuming we're right, 
and we're real and we're natural and we're normal, and people who disagree with us, we assume they're bad, they're evil, they're foreign, they're terrorists. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm arguing for today is subtlety, care, and compassion. Digital literacy is not a goal, it's not a cause, and it's not a panacea. Digital literacy is an excuse. It's a blockage to ask the real questions we need to be asking about injustice, about xenophobia, and about discrimination. What I ask we do today, on this final day of this wonderful conference, is all of us together start a quiet revolution, bringing high quality information back to our public debates and to our private lives. And you know what? We may just stop people being dumped by text message. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And now, let's see if they have some questions. And I will answer anything, absolutely anything. <laughs> there is one. I'll run up. Glad you're not in my shoes, darling. Unbelievable. Good morning. Uh, yeah, my name is Shay Sunstill. Good morning. Thank you. Morning. It was very fun. I'm from University College of Southeast Norway. Yep. Where I work in the library, but I'm also doing research uh, that has to do with climate. Yes. Climate change. Beautiful. And Beautiful. we all know that uh, climate and climate change, first of all, it's extremely depressing. I hate reading my literature. I don't even like writing about it, but I have to. Correct. Uh, it's very easy to dismiss by the media, but uh, like nobody wants to hear the truth. So how do we come with the facts? And first of all, how uh, get the actual facts out there and that it is happening, that 97% of clients, climate scientists agree. Yes. And how do we do it without making people want to just kill themselves? Yes, look, that's hard. I understand. I want to get off the planet myself, so I do understand that. But there is a, there is a great multimodal answer to your question. And in some ways, we had, through Al Gore's inconvenient truth, a signifier of what I'm about to say. So in other words, one of the great ways, because let's use the cliche, seeing is believing. People don't believe refereed literature because that's like clever people, and I'm not too interested in the refereed stuff, eh, because that's words. But do you remember the polar bear on the iceberg? Boom. So what I would be doing very clearly is using the climate scientists with very evocative and clear visuals and connecting the two. So allowing the refereed literature to inform the visual, but I would be very much going for that. So I'd be using Pinterest. I'd be using YouTube. I'd be going for it like a train. And a lot of guys and gals are and is effective, but I think we live, to be frank, in such anti-intellectual times. You know, this planet does not like smart people. Correct? So therefore, if smart people say something, you go, well, really? Do I look bothered? Do I really look bothered? And do you remember, I mean, Brexit was the great example of that, where, you know, like, what was it, Michael Gove, who said, oh, look, we've had enough of experts. We don't want experts telling us about what we should be doing. So let's, get, let's park the experts, let's use the expertise, but move platforms and render it visual, show what is happening. Thank you for your question, a great one, a great one. Good luck with your research, sounds fantastic. <laughs> Love you. She answers any, anything. Anything at all, <laughs> anything at all, I'm excited. There is another one. Oh, it's the back corner, it's always the way, you're doing it just to get him fit, I can see that. <laughs> That's great. How are you? Oh, that's a great frock. Is that a frock or a top? Hello. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. How are you? Birgitta. 
Beautiful, lovely to see you. Um, likewise. And I'm a shy southerner from Norway. We're kind of shy, so I don't know really what to say. Aww. But it, uh, it will, I will thank you for a very inspiring uh, lecture. And I've not Googled you, so I know that you have uh, written all these books. So oh. if you go to Twitter and Virak, you can see all uh, Tara's titles. And I've read uh, your um, uh, book about Google oh. uh, a few years ago, but I didn't know it was you, so that was great. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I will also ask you um, what to do, because I am presenting a paper about community building. Beautiful. Yeah, in, at Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. What could you say about that? Look, it's a great question, and look, I'm not anti-digital. When I lived and worked in the UK for 10 years, all these people loved to call a sort of short Australian blonde woman a Luddite, because obviously if I'm a woman, because I don't have things, I, I mustn't be very good with technology. Um, and that's the exact opposite. What I'm arguing for, though, is selection. And I think Twitter is outstanding, absolutely outstanding for two things, subject-led communities and communities in crisis. I think for those two variables, Twitter is absolutely outstanding. So if you are interested in climate change, you are interested in disintermediated librarianship, it's so large, you will find friends. The challenge with that, though, is often it ends up as a bit of an echo chamber as well. So I do this on Facebook. I've got, find me on Facebook, by the way, find me on Facebook. I've got a lot of friends on Facebook, but they all are of the progressive side of politics. So th I agree with all of them because they're all really brilliant people. And then when bad stuff happens on the planet, I get shocked because all my friends think the same as me. So the one thing we do have to watch with the community building of digitization is we seek out the like and avoid the people who disagree with us. So we have to manage conflict in a different way without trolling, without trolling. But great, uh, I'd love to, love, send me the paper. Send me the paper, love to see it. Fantastic. How are you? They're great glasses. Wow. I'm thinking about that we all are uh, participating in multiple communities. Yes. And the big question is how do these multiple communities coexist? Yes. And do we have some good models in order to guide us? in living this life, look, I th I, I, education. Yeah, look I, look, I don't think we do. I think probably some of the best models for dealing with multiculturalism, particularly critical multiculturalism, did actually come from Canada, particularly Canada from the 1970s. And you, they're still dealing with the fumes of that quite effective politics. And part of it is about linguistic justice. So it is understanding a diversity of languages, which of course on this part of the planet, you do better than anybody else offering kindness and decency and respectfulness to a diversity of languages doesn't exist in some other parts of the planet, but starting with languages, but always caring for the people. So it's understanding that people have lived in a context and understanding the rip and the violence, the semiotic and social violence of that removal. So I just think it's about time and respecting people moving through their journeys. And if we all stay in our modality, then you know, th that is where we end up with violence. Because we go, I am right, we all know people like this, there are countries in Europe like this, um, where I, this is what I think, this is my history, I'm the greatest, I ran a great empire, all oh, that came out, I ran a great empire, I'm in charge, I know what I'm doing. And bad stuff happens because you're not thinking about the world with generosity. So I, I still think Canada is a very good model. Thank you, great question, great, sad question, but important question. Hello, my queen. Hello. Um, what should be the first bachelor course we teach in literacy? Yes, what should, what should be the first course you teach in a Bachelor of Literacy? I would teach multimodality first. I would make the concept the course, because I think all of us, when we did these courses, we did information literacy or we, we segmented knowledge too much. And I think we live in a post-disciplinary environment. You know, knowledge is promiscuous. Knowledge is a bit of a tart, so we need ways and concepts to be able to order and model it in new ways post-disciplines. And so if I was doing it, I would teach multimodality first and then be able to teach form and content and all the other skill-based work that you do. Great question, 
Great question. Powerful. Hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking. Hold on. Have I frightened them, darling? No. I have a question. Oh, do you? If we're going to teach multimodality yes. first, yes. how do we get our partners, the teachers at university, to come along with us and, and partner up in doing that? Because that's a challenge as well. It certainly is. And one of the challenges, we've obviously got some guys and gals, particularly for working in a university environment. The great critique I have of higher education, and I have many, is that university academics don't have teaching qualifications. The, the assumption that if you have a PhD, you can teach. We know this to be farcical. Um, so what I would do is I would be very much stating that academics need to have teaching qualifications, and that requires you have an understanding of curricular design, and if you have an understanding of curricular design, you must have an understanding of multimodality, or else the curricular design won't work. So the first thing I'd do is I'd make it very clear, I'm sorry if you teach in a university, you need a teaching qualification. I've had people throw stuff at my car when I say that. Um, but but I'm, I'm sorry, I just think now that we've got the widening participation agenda in higher education, we're no longer teaching students who could be taught by an open refrigerator, okay? <laughs> We have to teach, I'm sorry, and my apologies to my great colleague yesterday with the keynote, I believe in teaching. I believe in librarians. Sorry, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's what leadership is. That's what expertise is. I'm not remotely against student-centered learning, it's crucial, but how do you know what you don't know? Have we exhausted them? It's at the back, too. That's terrific. <laughs> That's funny in a deep way. I'm going to be laughing all the way back to Australia about him running up and down like that. So nothing, darling. Nothing, nothing at all. Um, <laughs> how are you, my love? Yeah, me again. Uh, not so much a question. Uh, two things, though. Um, actually, in Norway, for, to teach at university, the doctorates do have to take um, high school, college uh, education. Yes. Pedagogic. Yes. As it's called. So they have not teaching qualifications necessarily, but they've sat and, yes. you know, Googled and uh, pretended to pay attention in a course yes. for a year. So the other is, um, can we see your shoes? <laughs> what was it? What in my shoes? Step back a little bit. Can oh, yes. Um, what I can say... They are fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I will tell the story, and I apologise for the streamed listeners. Um, the, I only wear a brand called Irregular Choice, because I have size 10 feet. I have enormous feet. Big hands, big feet, not saying nothing. But the problem is I, I can only buy shoes from a drag queen shop. So... <laughs> So, so these are these are called irregular choice. So those irregular choice. So those of you that are interested in it, www.irregularchoice.com, and I expect free shoes. Thanks very much. Um, uh, so yes, they're irregular choice. But and look, I love I love fashion. But part of it is also, to be frank, I'm amongst friends here. It is important in higher education that we create space for difference, and all sorts of interesting people, rather than just blokes and polyester suits. To be frank. Absolutely. And so. And I loved your point about the teaching qual. I want more, the notion that someone could sort of do eight weeks or 16 weeks and that's them done for teaching. That frightens me too. But at least it's something. I agree with you. Are we done? Are you happy with that? And I'm here for the day. So just come and have a chat with me. I would love to see you. Yeah. They're done. Um, thank you all for being absolutely splendid and thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. Love you. Love you. I'm really looking forward to your next book. Oh, you have a deal. Oh. I recommend you to do your literature searching and, and check out the literature.
Thank you. Uh, a little symbol of our thankfulness. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Love you, babe. Thank you. Ja, det er bare bitte litt praktisk informasjon. Eh, nå har jeg glemt programmet i hodet, men eh, vi har for det meste parallellsesjoner i dag. Eh, Petra Kutsjane er tre parallellsesjoner som vil være eh, noenlunde store, men vi er delt i tre. Vi ses alle sammen igjen mot slutten av dagen, eh, under avslutningen. Eh, da vil vi også eh, avsløre hvem som tar stafettpinnen og hvor det blir virak neste gang. Så jeg anbefaler dere å ta del i spenningen. Ellers så er dagen lagt opp eh, likt som i går. Dere finner rom og så videre i programmet. Eh, lunsjen serveres samme sted som i går på Fredrikkebygningen. De orange vestene og t-skjortene er like behjelpelige i dag som de var i går.